February 25th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Leviticus chapters 14 and 15 from the Old Testament. The Lord spoke to Moses, This is the law of the diseased person on the day of his purification when he is brought to the priest. The priest is to go outside the camp and examine the infection. If the infection of the diseased person has been healed, then the priest will command that two live clean birds, a piece of cedar wood, a scrap of crimson fabric, and some twigs of hyssop be taken up for the one being cleansed. The priest will then command that one bird be slaughtered into a clay vessel over fresh water. Then he is to take the live bird along with the piece of cedar wood, the scrap of crimson fabric, and the twigs of hyssop, and he is to dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird slaughtered over the fresh water and sprinkle it seven times on the one being cleansed from the disease. Pronounce him clean and send the live bird away over the open countryside. The one being cleansed must then wash his clothes, shave off all his hair and bathe in water and so be clean. Then afterward he may enter the camp, but he must live outside his tent seven days. When the seventh day comes, he must shave all his hair, his head, his beard, his eyebrows, all his hair, and he must wash his clothes, bathe his body in water, and so be clean. On the eighth day, he must take two flawless male lambs, one flawless yearling female lamb, three-tenths of an ephah of choice wheat flour as a grain offering mixed with olive oil and one log of olive oil, and the priest who pronounces him clean will have the man who is being cleansed stand along with these offerings before the Lord at the entrance of the meeting tent. The priest is to take one male lamb and present it for a guilt offering along with the log of olive oil and present them as a wave offering before the Lord. He must then slaughter the male lamb in the place where the sin offering and the burnt offering are slaughtered in the sanctuary because like the sin offering, the guilt offering belongs to the priest. It is most holy. Then the priest is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering and put it on the right earlobe of the one being cleansed on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest will then take some of the log of olive oil and pour it into his own left hand. Then the priest is to dip his right forefinger into the olive oil that is in his left hand and sprinkle some of the olive oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. The priest will then put some of the rest of the olive oil that is in his hand on the right earlobe of the one being cleansed, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on the blood of the guilt offering. And the remainder of the olive oil that is in his hand, the priest is to put on the head of the one being cleansed, so the priest is to make atonement for him before the Lord. The priest must then perform the sin offering and make atonement for the one being cleansed from his impurity. After that, he is to slaughter the burnt offering. And the priest is to offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. So the priest is to make atonement for him, and he will be clean. If the person is poor and does not have sufficient means, he must take one male lamb as a guilt offering for a wave offering to make atonement for himself, one-tenth of an ephah of choice wheat flour mixed with olive oil for a grain offering, a log of olive oil, and two turtle doves or two young pigeons which are within his means. One will be a sin offering and the other a burnt offering. On the eighth day he must bring them for his purification to the priest at the entrance of the meeting tent before the Lord. And the priest is to take the male lamb of the guilt offering and the log of olive oil and wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. Then he is to slaughter the male lamb of the guilt offering, and the priest is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering and put it on the right earlobe of the one being cleansed, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest will then pour some of the olive oil into his own left hand and sprinkle some of the olive oil that is in his left hand with his right forefinger seven times before the Lord. Then the priest is to put some of the olive oil that is in his hand on the right earlobe of the one being cleansed, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on the place of the blood of the guilt offering. And the remainder of the olive oil that is in the hand of the priest he is to put on the head of the one being cleansed to make atonement for him before the Lord. 
He will then make one of the turtle doves or young pigeons, which are within his means, a sin offering and the other a burnt offering along with the grain offering. So the priest is to make atonement for the one being cleansed before the Lord. This is the law of the one in whom there is a diseased infection who does not have sufficient means for his purification. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. When you entered the land of Canaan, which I'm about to give to you for a possession, and I put a diseased infection in a house in the land you are to possess, then whoever owns the house must come and declare to the priest, something like an infection is visible to me in the house. Then the priest will command that the house be cleared before the priest enters to examine the infection, so that everything in the house does not become unclean, and afterward the priest will enter to examine the house. He is to examine the infection, and if the infection in the walls of the house consists of yellowish-green or reddish eruptions, and it appears to be deeper than the surface of the wall, then the priest is to go out of the house to the doorway of the house and quarantine the house for seven days. The priest must return on the seventh day and examine it, and if the infection has spread in the walls of the house, then the priest is to command that the stones that had the infection in them be pulled and thrown outside the city into an unclean place. Then he is to have the house scraped all around on the inside, and the plaster which is scraped off must be dumped outside the city into an unclean place. They are then to take other stones and replace those stones, and he is to take other plaster and replaster the house. If the infection returns and breaks out in the house after he has pulled out the stones, scraped the house, and it is replastered, the priest is to come and examine it. And if the infection has spread in the house, it is a malignant disease in the house, it is unclean. He must tear down the house, its stones, its wood, and all the plaster of the house, and bring all of it outside the city to an unclean place. Anyone who enters the house all the days the priest has quarantined it will be unclean until evening. Anyone who lies down in the house must wash his clothes. Anyone who eats in the house must wash his clothes. If, however, the priest enters and examines it and the infection has not spread in the house after the house has been replastered, then the priest is to pronounce the house clean because the infection has been healed. Then he is to take two birds, a piece of cedar wood, a scrap of crimson fabric, and some twigs of hyssop to decontaminate the house, and he is to slaughter one bird into a clay vessel over fresh water. He must then take the piece of cedar wood, the twigs of hyssop, the scrap of crimson fabric and the live bird and dip them in the blood of the slaughtered bird and in the fresh water and sprinkle the house seven times. So he is to decontaminate the house with the blood of the bird, the fresh water, the live bird, the piece of cedar wood, the twigs of hyssop and the scrap of crimson fabric. And he is to send the live bird away outside the city into the open countryside. So he is to make atonement for the house and it will be clean. This is the law for all diseased infections for skull, for the diseased garment, for the house, for the swelling, for the scab, and for the bright spot, to teach when something is unclean and when it is clean. This is the law for dealing with infectious disease. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Speak to the Israelites and tell them, When any man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. Now this is his uncleanness in regard to his discharge. Whether his body secretes his discharge or blocks his discharge, he is unclean. All the days that his body has a discharge or his body blocks his discharge, this is his uncleanness. Any bed the man with a discharge lies on will be unclean and any furniture he sits on will be unclean. Anyone who touches his bed must wash his clothes, bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. The one who sits on the furniture the man with a discharge sits on must wash his clothes, bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. The one who touches the body of the man with a discharge must wash his clothes, bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. If the man with a discharge spits on a person who is ceremonially clean, that person must wash his clothes, bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. Any means of riding the man with a discharge rides on will be unclean. Anyone who touches anything that was under him will be unclean until evening, and the one who carries those items must wash his clothes, bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. 
Anyone whom the man with the discharge touches without having rinsed his hands in water must wash his clothes, bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. A clay vessel which the man with the discharge touches must be broken, and any wooden utensil must be rinsed in water. When the man with the discharge becomes clean from his discharge, he is to count off for himself seven days for his purification, and he must wash his clothes, bathe in fresh water, and be clean. Then on the eighth day he is to take for himself two turtle doves or two young pigeons, and he is to present himself before the Lord at the entrance of the meeting tent and give them to the priest. And the priest is to make one of them a sin offering and the other a burnt offering. So the priest is to make atonement for him before the Lord for his discharge. When a man has a seminal emission, he must bathe his whole body in water and be unclean until evening. And he must wash in water any clothing or leather that has semen on it, and it will be unclean until evening. When a man has sexual intercourse with a woman and there is a seminal emission, they must bathe in water and be unclean until evening. When a woman has a discharge and her discharge is blood from her body, she is to be in her menstruation seven days, and anyone who touches her will be unclean until evening. Anything she lies on during her menstruation will be unclean, and anything she sits on will be unclean. Anyone who touches her bed must wash his clothes, bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. Anyone who touches any furniture she sits on must wash his clothes, bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. If there is something on the bed or on the furniture she sits on, when he touches it, he will be unclean until evening. And if a man actually has sexual intercourse with her so that her menstrual impurity touches him, then he will be unclean seven days and any bed he lies on will be unclean. When a woman's discharge of blood flows many days not at the time of her menstruation or if it flows beyond the time of her menstruation, all the days of her discharge of impurity will be like the days of her menstruation. She is unclean. Any bed she lies on all the days of her discharge will be to her like the bed of her menstruation. Any furniture she sits on will be unclean like the impurity of her menstruation, and anyone who touches them will be unclean. And he must wash his clothes, bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. If she becomes clean from her discharge, then she is to count off for herself seven days, and afterwards she will be clean. Then on the eighth day she must take for herself two turtle doves or two young pigeons, and she must bring them to the priest at the entrance of the meeting tent. And the priest is to make one a sin offering and the other a burnt offering. So the priest is to make atonement for her before the Lord from her discharge of impurity. Thus you are to set the Israelites apart from their impurity so that they do not die in their impurity by defiling my tabernacle which is in their midst. This is the law of the one with a discharge, the one who has seminal emission and becomes unclean by it. The one who is sick in her menstruation, the one with a discharge, whether male or female, and a man who has sexual intercourse with an unclean woman. God, sometimes I think we skip chapters like this. We think it doesn't apply to us. Um, some of it's a little bit icky, <laughs> too much information, but if we skip any part of your word that you put together specifically and intentionally to give to us to live our lives, I think we miss some of the incredible points that you try and make in our hearts and, and teach us the way that we are supposed to live. Back in chapter 14, verse 34, you talk about when you entered the land of Canaan, which I'm about to give to you for a possession, and I put a diseased infection in a house in the land you are to possess, then whoever owns the house must come and declare to the priest, something like an infection is visible, visible to me in the house. The whole point in there, besides the regulations for clean and unclean, is the fact that you said that you put the diseased infection in that house. I would say that it has become my pet peeve, especially lately when people say, oh, that's the devil trying to tempt you, or that bad period you're going through, that's the devil trying to sidetrack you, um, or you're under attack because you're doing God's word. 
And while those things may be true, I have no doubt that a person called Satan exists. But I think people give him way too much power. <laughs> he does have power here on earth and this is his domain. And it's pretty easy to see this is his domain. But you reign sovereign over everything. Everything. And so I wish that you would help us see that just because we see something as bad, such as a, a disease infection in a house, or when we don't get the guy that we want, or we don't get the job we want, or when somebody close to us gets sick or even dies, all of those situations, a lot of times I hear people giving credit to the devil for. Whereas if we would wait and be patient, a lot of times we get to see you make those things good. Now you'll make them all good. It just may, may not be while, while we're in existence. But why not give you all the credit? Blessings in disguise, definitely. We may not know why you give us a diseased infection in our house. We may not know why we don't get the guy. We may not know why you don't let us have that job, but it doesn't matter because all glory should go to you. All power is yours. And we receive incredible blessings from you because you want only what is good for us. So if the particular house we're living in, you put a disease infection in that house, it is actually a blessing because you don't want us there. Or you want us to deal with something that is in that house. If we don't get the guy, the same thing. If we don't get the job, the same thing. And there's other things that are harder to understand. When babies die. When good people are killed. Those are really hard things to even see as good, much less a blessing. But we have to keep in mind... Those aren't our decisions to make judgment calls on those things. And it's definitely nothing I want to do to give power to Satan that he caused those things. I want to give all glory to you, God. I want to truly begin to understand just how big you are and how powerful you are and, and what sovereign really means over everything that you created. So even though we're going through chapters that are odd and sometimes a little bit gross, don't let us miss these important parts that you are telling us this to love us and protect us. And you intentionally do things that although on the surface we may see as bad or frustrating, we may get angry or jealous and see them as bad things in our lives when really you're just trying to redirect us to the good things in our lives. So today, God, help us see the good in everything because you promised us that, that you will make all things good. And I love watching how you do that in my life. That when I'm going through something bad, most of my friends will hear me say, oh good, I'm excited to see what God has up for this. <laughs> Because you usually are up to something, redirecting me to something better than what it is I'm seeking. Thank you for protecting us so much and loving us so unconditionally. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>